And now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Alex Tabarak. He is an economist at George Mason University and Mercatus Center Chair. He also co-authors the popular Marginal Revolution economics blog. Alex is here to give us an overview of two novel mechanisms for funding and discovering public goods, dominant assurance contracts and quadratic funding. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Carola. I could listen to you all day. I feel like I'm on NPR. So I'm gonna talk about uh, dominant assurance contracts or refund uh, bonuses and also about uh, quadratic uh, funding. I'm gonna move pretty quick since uh, some of this will be a review from some of the uh, earlier talks you've heard already. You all know public goods are a market challenge. So let's just look at a kind of a classic public good like uh, averting a flood. Everyone would be better off, right? If everyone contributed to averting the flood but as we know, there's also this do not contribute, do not contribute uh, equilibrium to this kind of uh, flood game. And that equilibrium is actually pretty powerful because two reasons, actually. First is the free rider problem. So that's the idea that if other people contribute, then you want to not contribute in order to sort of free ride on their uh, contributions. But also there's this assurance problem. And that is if other people don't contribute, you're worried that your contribution is sort of gonna be uh, wasted, right? So for both of these reasons, you may not wanna to contribute to this uh, public good. Now I'm gonna then uh, sort of take this in a couple of steps to get to refund bonuses. So let's first of all, think about the mayor of this town changes the game a little bit. The mayor says, uh, everybody who uh, is willing to build the dike, come meet at town hall and work will begin if and only if enough people gather so that the dike can be built high enough to avert the flood. Well, now you've sort of solved the assurance problem, right? Because uh, the only time that you will begin working on the dike is if enough people have gathered so that the dike can be built high enough to avert the flood. So people are assured that their contribution isn't gonna be wasted. We still have the free rider problem OK, but maybe if people are altruistic or they want to be seen to, as being altruistic, maybe that could be possibly overcome in this town. However, we can do a little bit better. Suppose now that the mayor says that the dike will be built if and only if everyone agrees to contribute. Well, now you've eliminated the free rider problem as well because there's no possible way to free ride on anyone because the dike will only be built if everyone contributes. So there's never any possibility of free riding. Even though you've eliminated the free rider problem and you've eliminated the assurance problem, you still haven't guaranteed success, uh, however, because there's still these two equilibria, this do not contribute, do not contribute equilibria to this game is still uh, possible because if I think for whatever reason that you will not contribute, then it's rational for me not to contribute. And if I don't contribute, then it's rational for you not to contribute. So this do not contribute equilibrium can be sort of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. And if there's even a little bit of uh, cost to contributing, then this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy gets even stronger. Okay, this of course is the crowdfunding, right? This assurance contract is what we're now pretty familiar with, uh, with Kickstarter and Indiegogo and places like that. Nobody pays unless the total, total contributions exceed some threshold. Interesting to note, however, that most campaigns on Kickstarter fail. So only about 37% of the campaigns succeed. Now, why is this? Well, there's two possible reasons. One is that maybe there's just a bunch of bad projects, right? Maybe there's just projects which uh, just are not worth uh, funding and people say, no, I don't want that, right? The other possibility, however, is that we have just a lot of this inefficient equilibrium that we're just gonna be, we're just stuck in the do not contribute, do not contribute equilibria, that it's the failure to coordinate on the good equilibrium. So now we get to the dominant assurance uh, contract or refund bonuses. So here, we're gonna have a crowdfunding entrepreneur offer potential contributors a refund bonus if they offer to contribute, but the contribution threshold is not 
reached. Okay? If the contribution threshold is not reached, then the potential contributor gets their contribution back plus the bonus. Well, if you now write this out in standard game theoretic terms, it's now actually a dominant strategy to contribute to the public good. Dominant strategy to contribute to the public good. Because imagine that you think other people are not going to contribute. Well, then you want to contribute to get the refund bonus, okay? And if other people do contribute, then you also want to contribute in order to push the game over the threshold and get the public good. So uh, either way, it's a good idea to contribute. And kind of neatly, interestingly, the refund bonuses are actually never paid. And now this is an equilibrium. In theory, we'll talk about what actually happens in a few minutes. Uh, but in equilibrium, the refund bonuses are never paid. Uh, this is sort of like uh, 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 deposit insurance in the uh, Diamond de Vivic uh, model, for those of you who know that. Okay, so this raises a bunch of questions. Um, it's true that if we don't need every player to contribute, okay, then it's no longer a dominant strategy, but it's a Nash equilibrium that the public good is funded. And it's the only, the only Nash equilibria are equilibria in which the public good is funded, but there still may be multiple equilibria in which the public good is funded. So there may be some coordination on getting to the right one and that could cause uh, problems. There's also issues about how should the refund bonuses be paid? Should it be like a fixed amount, like $10 or something like that? Should it be 10% of your contribution? Um, when should the refund bonuses be paid? Maybe we should give them early to early contributors only, not to later contributors. We actually have quite a bit of design freedom uh, here on these refund bonuses. And more generally, this is great in theory. Does it actually work? So uh, some colleagues and I, uh, Tim Kaysen and Roberta Sabricus, uh, have designed a lab-based uh, crowdfunding uh, platform to uh, test this uh, model. I'm not gonna go into detail on how the game uh, works, but it's a standard uh, laboratory kind of um, experimental model. And here's what we find. So in the baseline treatment, this is with just kind of the standard crowdfunding sort of contract with no refund bonuses, only about a third of projects are successfully uh, funded. And all of these projects are good projects, socially beneficial projects. So there's no bad projects here. And yet even so, only a third of them are successfully funded, even though 100% of them should be funded. So there is a large amount of equilibrium miscoordination. Uh, perhaps coincidentally, this is very close to the Kickstarter number, maybe that Maybe it's telling us something important, but maybe it's coincident. But in, in either case, it's pretty close to the Kickstarter number. Now, in the paper, we experiment with a bunch of different types of refund bonuses. So like a fixed bonuses, some proportional bonuses. Uh, we give some bonuses only to people who contributed early. We do a bunch of different things. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, you can look at the paper for that. Here's the bottom line, all of them work reasonably well. So the larger, the, 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 I, I, all of the bonuses increase uh, the success rate by about 20 percentage points or 50%, okay? So any type of refund bonus is, creates a really quite large increase in the number of projects which are successfully funded. Now, I pointed out that in theory, refund bonuses are never paid. What we just saw is that in practice, we don't see 100% success rates. Uh, our kind of best model, we're at like 67% uh, success rate. So there are some campaign failures. So that means that the entrepreneurs have to balance the fact that there are more successful campaigns with the fact that they have to pay some costs uh, when there are some unsuccessful uh, campaigns. Turns out with reasonably modest uh, markups, 10 or 
refund bonuses are profitable. So the greater number of successful projects being funded is more than enough to pay for the refund bonuses on the projects which are unsuccessful. Okay, midway summary. Refund bonuses, the double crowdfunding campaign success, they pay for themselves. All kinds of refund bonuses, fixed, proportional, early, constant, they work well. And er, it turns out early refund bonuses work especially uh, well. Again, I see the, see the paper uh, for that. What the refund bonus kind of scheme does is it works especially well when you know the public good that you want. And the problem is getting people to fund it. Okay. So, you know, you want to build a lighthouse, you know, how tall the lighthouse has to be, you know, what the cost is going to be. The only issue is, can you get people in the surrounding area, you know, to fund it? Uh, you want to build a public monument. You want to build a dam. Okay. You kind of know technologically what it is that you want. And the issue is to get people to pony up. That's what the refund bonus scheme is good at. There's another problem, however, with public goods. And that is nobody really knows what, what are the best public goods, okay? How much should we spend on public goods? How much should we spend on public parks versus on firework shows? We don't really know the value of these things or, and, and we don't have any relative, we don't have a market test. And this is where information revelation mechanisms like quadratic funding can help to reveal information about which public goods uh, one should provide, okay? The, as we'll see, the cost of this is that it requires some government or outside funding. So let's look at these revelation mechanisms. So again, very briefly, kind of a brief review, we have some public good, okay? And uh, we have two people, they have some benefit for the public good. We know that we need to sum up their marginal benefit curves, you know, and we can find the optimum, right? This is how we do it in, you know, Econ 101, Samuelson condition for finding the public good, okay? By the way, note that in this example, here's the cost of the public good, here are the benefits. Neither of the players is willing to provide the, any of the public good on their own. The first unit of the public good costs more than either of them are willing to provide on their own, but still the optimum provision is quite large, it is 10. Now the issue here is I can draw the optimum in the classroom, but how does the government know what these marginal benefit curves uh, are, okay? How can anybody figure out what the optimum is? without knowing the marginal benefit curves and people don't wanna reveal these curves, they want a free ride because it's a public good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we know? How do we get to 10? How do we know what the uh, optimum is? And this is where the quadratic funding mechanism is so cool because it's a remarkable information revelation mechanism. And what uh, Buterich, uh, Buterin, uh, Hitzig and Weil uh, show is that if the funder agrees to subsidize contributions to the public good according to the quadratic funding formula, then individuals will agree to contribute such that the optimum is reached, right? So given the quadratic funding formula, the optimum is revealed by individual choices. So what is the quadratic funding formula? Well, you've heard it a couple of times. I think it's useful to kind of see it written out. It's a little bit less uh, intimidating, I think, when you see it written out, because it's pretty simple. It's just the sum of the square roots of the contributions all squared. So if uh, C, C1 is the contribution of individual one, and C2 is the contribution of individual two, then you sum up the square root of all of these contributions and you square that whole thing, okay? So here's the point again, knowing that the total funding of the public good will be given by G, this formula, individuals will contribute such that G is equal to G star, where G star is the optimum level, okay? So the Nash equilibrium has the optimum public good being chosen. 
So to go back to that little example that I uh, had earlier, I'm not going to prove this, but I'm just going to tell you, we have these two individuals. They're told that G is going to be equal to the sum of the square roots of their contributions all squared. Then it is in their individual self-interest to choose contribution levels, C1 and C2, turns out C1 is equal to 45 over 8, C2 is equal to 5 over 8. That's their privately rational, self-interested, uh, optimum contribution levels. And indeed, when you then put that into the formula, you get that the, what you get out is 10. You get out G star. You get out G star. So the government doesn't have to know the uh, marginal benefit curves. It just has to tell people, this is what the funding level is going to be. And then people will choose their own contribution levels such that we reach the optimum. Notice we're spending 10 on the public good, but 45 over eight plus five over eight, okay, 50 over eight does not equal 10. So uh, we have a, a subsidy in this case of 3.75. Let's talk a little bit more about the subsidy because it's important. So this is G is the amount of the public good, which is going to be provided. The subsidy is then G minus the sum of the actual contributions. And we can show this using a kind of neat little diagram due to uh, Vitalik. So on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we're going to put the sum of the square root of the contributions. So assume we have four of them like this. Then on the vertical axis, we're going to put the same thing. So the squares, okay, the sum of the, uh, some of the square roots all squared is this entire area, the yellow area. So that is G. And then the contributions, you see, are uh, the green area. Okay, so uh, square root of C1 times square root of C1 is uh, C1. So these are the contributions. So what we see then is that the subsidy is the yellow area minus the green uh, area. A couple of things we can show with this. Um, the total subsidy is going to increase as each individual contribution becomes small relative to the whole. Okay, So if we have people who are contributing like this, then you can see the subsidy has gotten bigger. And if you have people who are atomistic, right, who are really small, then the subsidy gets huge. The subsidy gets huge. There's a corollary uh, to this, which is that if you just have one contributor, then there's no externality and there's no subsidy. And indeed, the formula tells you that. OK. And the way some of the guys in the quadratic you know, funding movement, radical exchange movement, the way they sort of like to put this right is that quadratic funding penalizes the oligarchs OK, and benefits the people. Uh, the idea being that you see that the big guys are not subsidized that much, but lots of small people are subsidized uh, a lot. OK, now this is a kind of a uh, it's a nice slogan <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. Right. Um, it's not actually how the formula was designed. It happens to be a consequence of the formula, but the formula wasn't designed to sort of penalize the oligarchs and benefit the people. There's a more fundamental aspect to where the formula comes from. And it comes from this. The idea is that if the contributors cared about one another as much as they cared for themselves, that they would increase their respective contributions and act as if they were a single person, right? So this is what uh, Glenn and Leon uh, a little bit were talking about uh, today that maybe naturally some of them already are acting uh, in this way. People have some natural connections. Um, I'm not sure, by the way, that like just because I am affiliated with George Mason does not mean that I am altruistic towards George Mason. So uh, I'm not sure that the uh, scheme, which uh, Glenn and Leon were, were talking about, gets at the really fundamental issue, which is the altruism issue, rather than simply the connection or the affiliation uh, issue. But they probably have an answer to that. Anyway, so what are the subsidies? Well, the subsidies are what are needed to make the total contribution as if 
one and two cared for one another and sort of internalized the externalities. So that's what the subsidies are doing. They're acting uh, to make it what, how much would people give if the externalities were internalized? Pretty clear problem is a Sybil attack, right? So again, simple example, suppose that uh, person one contributes four, person two contributes four, total contribution is eight, okay? G, sum of the uh, square roots all squared is 16, so the subsidy is 16 minus eight or eight, okay? Now suppose that C1 Sybils. So C1, instead of submitting four, they submit one, 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 you know, they submit one four times. Okay, C2 continues to submit four. So the total contribution from C1 and C2 is still eight, but look at what happens to the amount of the public good. It goes up from 16 to 36. And of course the subsidy then goes up from uh, eight to 28. So you get a massive increase in the subsidy through this Sybil attack, all right? So there's a clear incentive to Sybil and that gets worse if the donor, of course, is also the recipient, right? So you have kind of a Sybil attack plus self-dealing is, uh, you know, Sybil attack is going to be bad. Sybil attack plus self-dealing really bad, right? So you're going to need some kind of identity proof to protect the uh, subsidy, right? That's one issue, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the other issue, and this is a neat little thing from Gitcoin, is that the Nash equilibrium of the quadratic funding mechanism is at the optimum uh, level, but it's not a dominant strategy and it's kind of a, it's not an obvious strategy either. Okay. So you're definitely gonna have to kind of grope towards uh, equilibrium. Um, in fact, I'm not sure this has been tested in a lab, so I don't know how far whether you actually reach equilibrium or how close you get to the equilibrium, you're, you're certainly going to be better off. Um, but it's uh, it's not an obvious strategy. So it's going to take some work for people who may have to play it multiple times and kind of, as I said, kind of grope towards the equilibrium strategy because it's not an obvious one. Quadratic funding in practice. Um, so we're very fortunate today. We've heard from several people from uh, uh, Gitcoin um, who, to their great credit, have been uh, implementing uh, this quadratic funding uh, mechanism. Fantastic data, doing a fantastic job. So in their latest round, uh, Gitcoin, uh, maybe might not, might not be their latest, but one recent round, they uh, donated 1.38 million. So pretty serious numbers to 812 different projects. That was 880,000 from over 12,000 contributors with 500,000 in uh, subsidies. Sybil attacks have been pretty common, is my understanding. Uh, like some projects promised people who donated to their project that they would get rewarded later, that kind of thing. And remember, a small donation can result in a relatively large increase in the subsidy. So there's a lot there where for the project to fund back to, to uh, uh, under the table to uh, give people some of the cut of that subsidy. So because the subsidy can increase so dramatically when you have a lot of small givers, then there's enough funds there to support a kind of bribery uh, at decent levels. So uh, what has Gitcoin been doing uh, to kind of avoid this problem? sort of a combination of machine and human intelligence uh, to kind of look for uh, self-dealing, to look for civil attacks. And they're moving towards more identity, identity verification using uh, GitHub accounts, okay? And also, I don't know if they've done this, or but they're thinking about it, making donations impossible to prove so that the donee doesn't know who gave the money and the donor can't prove that they donated. So if you have people who are willing to do a civil attack to rip off the funder, right, then they're probably also willing to lie <laughs> to say that they contributed uh, even when they didn't. And so if you make it difficult to prove that you contributed, 
then maybe there'll be less uh, incentive, well, there will be less incentive to do these uh, civil attacks. There is kind of a fundamental problem here, um, which again, Glenn and Leon were getting at uh, somewhat, Vitalik has, has talked about, but the fundamental problem is that mechanisms that allow unorganized groups to coordinate, they're also vulnerable to allowing to having organized groups that collude, right? So coordination is a nice word, collude is a bad word, but they're really the same thing, right? So if you allow nice people to coordinate, you're also helping bad people to collude. And, you know, maybe coordination or collusion is in the eyes of the beholder to some extent. So it may be difficult to separate out these two things, coordination and collusion. So uh, let me summarize on the two mechanisms. So the refund bonuses improve the crowdfunding contract and they can solve the contribution problem. The quadratic funding mechanism can elicit people's preferences for public goods using a subsidy. You have to have the subsidy. What's the big picture here? Okay, what is the big picture? Well, the big picture to me is comes from Hayek and thinking about competition as a discovery procedure. Okay. So Hayek argued that you know, one of the big advantages of the market is not that price is pushed to marginal cost, not that competition pushes price to marginal cost. The big advantage is because of free entry, and because of profits that go to innovators, you get lots of people trying to solve problems. Okay. You figure out what the product is that people actually want. Okay. It's not that, you know, price driven down to marginal cost. Uh, it's that you figure out what, what is the thing? What is the product, right? What is, what is it that people actually want? How are their preferences satisfied? And the problem is, is that for public goods, we haven't been able to use competition to discover the most demanded public goods produced in the least costly ways, right? So crowdfunding with refund bonuses and the quadratic funding mechanism are two mechanisms that could bring competition to the provision of public goods. And more generally creating mechanisms that allow entrepreneurs and markets to produce public goods that actually may create more and better public goods than we now know uh, exist, right? So opening up, we may be surprised uh, at once we allow entrepreneurs or once entrepreneurs have the ability to create public goods and put public goods to the market test, we may discover that there are more interesting public goods than we ever dreamt of. Thank you very much. <laughs>